I'm sure that we all have a groove template as musicians. Nice. We all have one, don't we, in, yes. in us. Yeah. Uh, I'm not comparing us to a computer, but we do. Yeah. And that, in that three weeks, we all work each other's out. Absolutely. We all work out the territory, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you've got a good ear to, to, to hear that, 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 that groove, then, yeah. then, no, then like you it. do, don't you? Yeah. Um, totally. So if you learn it, if you learn that, if you, if you learn the tunes and then you don't do rehearsal and you don't go in your gig, it's, that's one thing that's different to the three week rehearsal, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost like, I love that groove template. It's such a great yeah. way to, to. I've just got that term off of logic or something. That's great. Like that. It's perfect. But, that's but I think a... we've all got one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, totally. And it's like, if you don't have that rehearsal time, as you said, to work out each other's templates, groove templates, yeah. you're kind yeah. of doing it on stage. Yeah. Which yeah. is... Or, or you or you could all just become, you know, stunningly perfect metronome players. Yeah. Which is actually probably, that's what happens a lot, I think, now. Yeah. Yes, I'll just introduce you to, I mean, some people who are going to watch this will know who you are, but the people who don't, Addy yeah. is guitarist, uh, composer and writer. Credits include, via a short skin, stint at the Royal Opera House, which is extremely, yeah, extremely, <laughs> extremely jealous of that. Um, <laughs> Black Peaches, White Denim, Imelda May, Mark Ronson, Dude I Love, which is Paolo Natini. Yeah. And then, you know, quite a long working relationship with Andy Burroughs. Which is where we, me and you met. That's first, where we met. We, I was we had a beer with him, yeah. Yeah, I was trying to remember. So it would have been, I would have been doing that drum thing in Winchester. I think it might have been 20 years ago. No way. Maybe. Or 19. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, there was a big drum school, wasn't there? That's but. it, yeah. So that's where I'd have been there. And I hadn't... And Andy just got the call for razor light or something. Yeah, it was literally, it was probably the day or something. <laughs> it was the day they called him and said, yeah, you're in. Right. I think, or the week, you know, or a couple of days, yeah. Yeah, blimey. Because he was in a band with his brother, wasn't he? His brother was the bass player, I think. Or... After razor light. No, when I met him. Cause he's, I oh, talk, really? I remember talking, and his brother was there having a pint as well, and he was like, I can't really yeah. say no to my brother going off and joining Razorlight, but it means he's leaving our band. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 it's true. Yeah, right. So anyway, <laughs> let's get back to you anyway. It's far yeah. more important. <laughs> what is it about the guitar that started you? You know, because obviously you love of music, but then you've got, yeah. to, pick an, you've got to pick an instrument, haven't you? Yeah. Um, probably, uh, I, I would say, listening to nothing more than just the classic rock guitarists mm -hmm. chuck berry the beatles there's Riffs, nothing, nothing wrong with Riffs, that want to play them <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i was the same as like i heard Jimi hendrix i was yeah. like i want to do that i didn't know what a bass was and what a guitar was just yeah. someone gave me a bass guitar and i thought well that must be the same thing right and then just yeah. start playing along and then eventually you work out oh no it's not the yeah. really exciting one it's the other one that yeah. isn't the drums but, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was definitely the 90s. It was probably 1990 that I picked up a guitar, and that was, uh, I feel it was a, a superb era for guitar yeah. music. Yeah. It, was pretty, it was pretty spot on for me to be immersed with it. Yeah. <laughs> was it but then, then you were allowed to play guitar and be on Radio 1. That's it, yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. All the kind of blocks went together, didn't they, as to, as to how you can get yourself onto a stage or how you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, definitely. and uh, and you and you could, uh, you know, CDs were a, a big sort of magical thing, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. So how did how did you start learning then? Um, I I think I probably had I definitely had lessons mm -hmm. uh, outside school and um, just you know friends of my parents teaching me a few chords that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, had this um, old Spanish Spanish guitar that you know used to, um, and then yeah, just moved on to 
getting an electric guitar and then that's it, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's the level of excitement when you get an electric guitar and plug it into an amp. Yeah. Like, yeah. Wow. I went to quite a, a rural school, actually, right. in Hampshire, mm -hmm. near Winchester, actually. And um, there weren't many kids in it, but the, um, the, kids that, the kids that played guitar were, you know, fanatical. So that helped as well, you know. It was like a, a sort of alternative scene. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. I absolutely. think probably music then might may have been um, rave music was quite mm -hmm. um, popular as well, wasn't it? As, yeah, as yeah. well as as well as guitar music. And I think you were a kind of a raver, or you were a rock and roller. You know. Yeah. It was, it was a bit like I found it was a bit like that when I was. Oh, it was. I mean, there was no real crossover. I think the only guitar no, band that Stone Roses were... maybe. But Sto yeah, I don't yeah. know whether I yeah I don't know whether I was introduced to Stone Roses Roses. Uh, when I was younger. Yeah. I mean, I was talking to um, the guy, he's, he's actually a dance music producer who lives in the village, and he <laughs> massively came from the rave side, and obviously I was on the Britpop side, and he used to wear a T-shirt when he was DJing, which just said, fuck Britpop. <laughs> <laughs> so there was that kind of divide. I think maybe all the ravers, when they were coming down, maybe listened to the Verve, probably, because yeah. it was a quite druggy music. I think that was kind of like yeah. the only acceptable bit. They certainly weren't going to put Oasis on or Suede. <laughs> that would have kind of ruined your mood a little bit, I imagine. So how did you, so you're starting to learn. So then how did it become a career? Um, I think I, uh, based in Hampshire mm -hmm. and and kind of hanging around a few musicians there, I did start playing gigs for money for um, probably, you know, the odd artist, mm -hmm. even, even, even when I was probably... 18, 19, the odd, you know, artist who might have, you know, a manager who's putting a bit of money into them. And yeah, I started doing that quite, quite early, but I hung around, um, I hung around in, in Wiltshire and Hampshire for probably till I was 25, mm -hmm. actually doing that kind of thing. Right. And then, and then I made the leap to move to London. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, which then, then I started doing the same thing. And the first band that I started playing before we did a tour, so that was it. You know. Oh right, okay. Who was that? Yeah, um, they were an indie band called The Boy Least Likely To. Oh yeah, okay, right. Yeah, I know the they, name. They, they 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 had a uh, um, uh, their their single was called Be Gentle with Me. Mm -hmm. It was it was quite a well known mm. song. Um, and we toured. Uh, they were signed to Nineteen Entertainment, who had a sub a label. And so, so that put us round. We did two American tours, and I think their single had a bit of traction on college radio. You know, college radio in yeah. in the US. Yeah. So that immediately meant that there were gigs there to play, yeah. and they had a good deal. So, yeah, I think we did n nine weeks in total in the yeah. USA and and the UK as well. We didn't do much Europe. Uh -huh. I've did that. I've done the whole sort of uh, American college radio. Thing where you know you go to the radio station, the little radio station, and do your, your acoustic set and your interview, yeah. and then you go to the gig, then you get on the tour yeah. bus, rinse the, and repeat. The, work, the most memorable one from that time for me is I'm sure you've done it, <laughs> David. Is uh, morning becomes eclectic. Yeah. On uh, <laughs> uh, it's LA, it's an LA college college radio, yeah. Already, isn't it? Yeah, that's funny. It's I mean, what a great way to start, though. I mean, obviously, you know, yeah. doing all the stuff in Hampshire, I'm going to make the move to London. Yeah, and then it's al almost seamless. It's like, oh, okay. So now you've gone pfft, on tour in America. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It was yeah, it was quite quick to get yeah in a, in a project that that got signed and yeah. Yeah, no, that's really cool. So then, how, so then, what happened after then? Because a lot of people watching this think that um, you know, like session players, whatever we want to call ourselves. Yeah, um, they get noticed because they can play really fast on YouTube. Right. But it doesn't work like that. It's always through... It doesn't I'm, always, does it? No. No, I always found it's through connections. That, you know, someone yeah. recommends you. So how did you then go after the boy to, um, to then to win? What was the um, next thing? Uh, literally through, yeah, it's just through circles of friends and other mem members of the band. The, the bass player and the drummer from, formed a band called Sweet Billy Pilgrim. Okay. Who, who did quite well. Yeah. We, you know, and I did, a, I kind of, I think after that, I kind of went on and did a few gigs with them. And then Andy Burroughs left Razorlight and formed I Am Arrows. So I was in that. Yeah. And, um, 
yeah, and then, you know, it's just kind of circle of friends. Also, connections sometimes always does lead back to where you grew up as well. That, that, that Those bunch of guys was definitely, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's that little community, isn't it, of people like, yeah. you know, who, who but actually... No, I, I always like that subject of, you know, your your path of trees that you've sw- yes. you swung from. What can you do to influence it? Probably nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. No, it's true. It's, but it, it is that thing, you're like, you know, you said the people who were quite militant and like really into playing guitar. Yeah. And it's that circle of people and then you keep the connections going. Again, it's yeah. the you know, all those people you used to know, and then if they get someone, then they'll recommend you for this. And it's how, it's how these things grow, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I feel like probably there is a new generation of, um, maybe there's a new generation of musical directors working within um, pop music mm-hmm. that probably do troll Instagram and YouTube mm-hmm. for for guys that are transcribed. Yes. So, I don't know. I, I feel like they might. might. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I think there is a circle of that. Um, obviously, because that's where a lot of, where of young musicians now, I'm not saying yeah. we're old, but we're probably a little bit older, or I certainly yeah. am. Um, so sort of like younger MDs will probably look for, oh, this kid's really good, or he or she's great at doing this. Yeah. Um, because that's their ease of getting, getting to them and probably being quite blatant about it. They can get in cheap. You know, because it's yeah. like, just jump in and go, yeah, do you want to play with, I don't know, Harry Styles, 200 quid a show? They'll be like, oh my God, that's amazing. When yeah, the reality yeah. is they yeah. should be charging two grand a show. That's it. Yeah, no, they're, they're, it's true, yeah. It's very yeah, true, yeah. Well, you know, it's how all those things go. But so then, yeah. you know, I mean, okay, so let's talk about some of the people you played with. And then yeah. I, want to, I want to come back to, particularly to Black Peaches and White Denim, because yeah. you just made the White Denim album. But we'll yeah. come to that in a minute. And I love, I, I, what was it? I don't, know, I don't know how to rock and roll or I don't know the rules of rock and roll. I don't understand rock and roll. I don't understand roll. rock and roll. What a tune and I what a great that, title. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> let's kind of, before we come to there. And then obviously through that, then you start working with names that, you know, people who don't even love music know. You know, like, <laughs> let's up like, you know, Imelda May. How did that, yeah. how, did, how did that come about? Um, well, um, Imelda was, because I, because I, I toured with Paolo Nettini mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the year before I started playing with Imelda. Um, the guitarist called Donny Little. Mm-hmm. I was I was covering for Donny with with Paolo, or you know, because Donny was playing for Imelda. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of you know, he had some other stuff to do, and he said, "Hey, would you like to play with Imelda?" So the okay. connect the connection of of Paolo goes back to the other two bands I mentioned I play with, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's, um, let's, let's go to Paolo, because yeah. I absolutely love him to bits. Mm. But I remember um, first time I heard him, he was doing a sound check. I was playing with Weller, and we were uh, halfway mm. through a six-month tour. And you know what it's like. You're not interested in the support band you've never heard of. What are you yeah. interested in? Like, we've sound checked, where's catering? Yeah. I remember <laughs> we were all sitting in catering, Paul, all the bands, all the crew even the merchandise people. And then yeah. we hear this voice coming from the hall next door. Yeah, yeah. And every single person, every man and woman in the Paul Weller setup, even the caterers, mm. we all left to see who this is. And it was just Paolo with the um, guitarist and the drummer because they had bass on yeah. track in those days. And no, he was it just, been Donnie, yeah. That's it. And he was just sound checking. Um, I don't even know what song it was. And it was one of those moments you're like, who the fuck is this? Because <laughs> yeah. it was that voice. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, and no, then got it, to hang out with him a bit because we did quite a few shows and, you know, he's such a nice kid as well. Totally, yeah. Yeah, um, he, um, I did, what was what was really pleasing is I did um, a South American tour with him. <laughs> so, um, it was just, yeah, it was it was, it was was fantastic to part, be part of because I just, you know, rehearsed. Well, there was one gig in Switzerland which we rehearsed for in Switzerland the day before. And then a week later, we went to South America. So it, it was very memorable, yeah. And playing with him and playing his, his songs and working with him, he's, yeah, he's superb. Yeah. And so, his band, they're all, they're all awesome. Yeah, really nice, really really good people as well. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's obviously, you know, when you've got a singer that good, the songs, yeah, he's, you know. What he's good at is... Um, um, so, you know, s- certainly his his biggest asset is just yeah. Obviously, delivering a vocal mm-hmm. is just 
absolutely perfect, pitch perfect, everything. Um, and just, you know, his I think his work, work ethic in the studio, from what I hear, is and his, his ability to write a top-line melody, lyrics, you know, He's got all of those things in place to be yeah. to be that perfect, yeah. Yeah, and his success has proved it. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. kind of undi- yeah. it's kind of undeniable, isn't it? Yeah, but it's like um, in a way, it's like you know, it's. I mean, I work with Ashcroft, and I've been for quite a while now. Yeah, it's that same yeah. thing. It's like it's that yeah. God given voice and the yeah. ability to 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 make it happen. Yeah, it's, it's such a pleasure to play around. I was going to say play yeah. behind, but you know to, to support because it's, it's so much easier. It's like you know, I've, you know, when you work with people who are maybe aren't that good at delivering the melody or projecting it. Yeah, it's, you have to like put. It's not put more because you still give everything you've got, but yeah, the songs can have have their own energy, don't they? It's really nice when you when you whether you've listened to a song or not uh, previously, or whether you're a fan, you play with someone. And then you're rehearsing their tune, and then the melody comes and it fits with the chords. It's lovely when you have that moment. You go, "Good." Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> if, whether you'd listened to it on the radio before or not, but when you're actually playing it, you look at it from a different. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and he's one of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's a to- <laughs> totally different experience, you know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, so with that, just going back to the power thing again. Yeah. So obviously, it was really quick prep time, wasn't it? It was a two-hour set, yeah, and yeah. and and I got sent um, um, the, a live recording of one of their gigs on uh-huh. on the you know the, the most recent two-hour set they'd done with the stem of the guitar track, uh-huh. um, and yeah, uh, that's how I le- that's how I learned the set mm-hmm. because the versions of the of the tunes were were, were all quite quite different arrangements, you know. Yeah, well, they're going to be different from the record, aren't they? Because yeah. that whole sort yeah. of ex- yeah, they, they, because because this band is so that you know so long standing and mm-hmm. such a unit, mm-hmm. um, the, the versions of their songs are, are really well worked and, and diff, different different to the record. So it was yeah. it was almost I didn't even I did do you know what I mean I didn't reference I just I just learned the live set yeah you know? yeah yeah absolutely because obviously it's that thing where they've grown over time yeah it's that. Know? All the yeah. ups and downs of the dynamics. This bit is longer than it is on the record, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so, how was that fitting in to like that long-standing sort of unit? And then you come in. Yeah, I found it. I found yeah, definitely with that. Yeah, really good actually. And and um, yeah, with that particular group of, of guys, it was it was they were so friendly and yeah. Paolo creates a good vibe. I think so. It's yeah. you know. Um. Everyone's everyone's happy there, yeah. It's, uh, yeah right. It was it was really good, yeah. I mean, um, and I already knew the keyboard player as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that always helps. I mean, that's another thing that I think people don't quite understand is a lot of how, how to make it work musically is is being sociable with each other as well. Yeah. Yeah. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Such so your a, communication. Yeah, is, yeah. It's such a huge, yeah. huge asset. Obviously, you know, you, everyone needs if, if you know if someone is going to make a living as a musician. They need to be able to yeah. play, yeah. <laughs> but they also need to listen to what everyone else is doing, yeah, and and appreciate and sort of have empathy and get and get on, yeah, in that circle. Right, yeah. yeah. One thing I one thing I um, I have noticed in in recent times, I don't know myself, but um, um, uh, rehearsal seems to be. Um, not as important as it as it used to be, mm-hmm. or um, you're expected to, to raise your game pretty quickly. Or as it used to be, don't worry, come to rehearsal, work it out. Yeah, yeah. Now it's work it out before rehearsal, yeah. and we just run it, run the set. Yeah, that, which, which I, I don't mind doing, uh-huh. but um, I prefer option the one. Oh, absolutely. It's like yeah. there's nothing better than three weeks rehearsal. Yeah, you know, and you can go. Well, I don't really know, and there's, and there'll there probably be some new songs as well, mm. you know. And new. I feel like that's, that three weeks rehearsal is an art form in itself that's being lost. Yeah, yeah. yeah for whatever reason, I don't know, but Pro- yeah, probably budget. Of course, yeah. <laughs> and then the people who 
<laughs> don't need it to be budget. Just jump on it because they'll all save money, make more profit. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it is that thing. It's almost like you know when I used to, when you used to work well, even though it was the same band always. There'd yeah. only be like six months between, maybe maybe even a year if we'd made a new record, but we'd all have made that record anyway. But we'd still yeah. rehearse for about three or four weeks. Just yeah. just to go through everything again and try new stuff. And Paul yeah. might have a song he'd just written that morning. Yeah. You know, just to play through it and not... I'm sure that we all have a groove template as musicians. Nice. We all have one, don't we, in, yes. in us. Yeah. Uh, I'm not comparing us to a computer, but we do. Yeah. And that, in that three weeks... We all work each other's out. Absolutely. We all work out the territory, don't we? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if you've got a good ear to, to, to hear that, 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 that groove, then, yeah. then, no, then you do, don't you? Yeah. Um, totally. So if you learn it, if you learn that, if you, if you learn the tunes and then you don't do rehearsal and you don't go and do a gig, it's, that's one thing that's different to the three week rehearsal, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost like, I love that groove template. It's such a great yeah. way to, to. I've just got that term off of logic or something. That's great, like that. it's perfect. But, but I think a, we've all got one. Yeah, yeah, oh, totally. And it's like, if you don't have that rehearsal time, as you said, to work out each other's templates, groove templates, yeah. you're kind yeah. of doing it on stage. Yeah. Which yeah. is... Or, or you or you could all just become, you know, stunningly perfect metronome players. Yeah. Which is actually probably, that's what happens a lot, I think, now. Yeah, with, yeah. With some gigs, with some, you know... Well, um, yeah, probably because which is not lot. to be turned, you know, it's not to be turned up at. But I'm just, it's just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's my perspective, yeah, yeah. It's particularly a lot with, with you know, a lot of tracks being run as well. You of know. course, that's changed it. Yes, exactly. Huge, yeah, hugely, and it's that sort of thing. Yeah, when you've when you've got someone on the side of the stage with about six max running all the tracks and all the backups, and it's like this is the arrangement of the song. Whereas sometimes <laughs> it may well yeah. be at this moment. It might be really nice to extend the guitar solo, or not do the repeat chorus at the end, or bring everything yeah. down, and then you're kind of stuck with that. Well, the perfect timing, and it's like, well, yeah. you know, yeah. if we knock that bit out of the song now, the strings are all going to be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, uh... yeah. yeah, yeah, which is what a great thing about you know, as you're saying, like slipping straight into uh, the Paolo's band because it, they were su such a good unit, and everyone was, got yeah. They, they all knew each other's grooves, basically. They did, yeah. Yeah, no. Uh, actually, for uh, uh, it's probably actually, it, it was a lead guitar role because, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just was. Yeah. It's pro probably a little bit easier to, to in that groove department. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, you're just playing little hooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, don't, you don't need to know all the chords. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay, that's, I mean, that's, that's really cool. I love that groove template. I'm going to steal it. Sorry. <laughs> I think it should yeah. be shared around anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you pick up on it just through listening to music, listening to different bands, don't you? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Like if you stuck half of Bob Dylan's band with half of Daft Punk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it would just be... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounds, you know, yeah. weird straight away. But... They'd yeah. obviously give them three weeks, they'd work it all out. Give them three, yeah, exactly. Give them three <laughs> weeks, they'd probably go, okay, mm, <laughs> we need to get find some middle ground here, or otherwise it's going to be it's going to be a, probably a little bit too experimental. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then you obviously worked with Mark Ronson as well. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, quite a few things actually. Probably, for, probably about five years on and off. Mm -hmm. um, um, studio stuff and mainly this production at um, uh, the Royal Opera House which is um, a half an hour piece of music mm -hmm. composed by Mark and a superb songwriter called Andrew Wyatt mm -hmm. um, and features guest singers um and um yeah i <laughs> i've done it twice so then yeah. we, we ran it twice the the, the the music is to uh for the for ballet that um a very famous choreographer called wayne mcgregor mm -hmm. he, he he is the it's his ballet right um and it's just that he 
he's been known to work with pop artists before and he, he approached Mark and that was it. And Mark, Mark did it, yeah. Yeah. Did it, put it, Mark put it together and wrote it with various people. Some of the lyricists wrote the, some of the singers wrote the lyrics. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's fantastic. It's called Carbon Life. Sadly, because of, because of the way that um, the Royal Opera House work, there isn't really any material available to either listen to or yeah. watch. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they have it all. It's all filmed, but it's all really well. But they have it. They have it all in their archive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it's very, very, very interesting music, and um, the drums weren't live. We played right. on with track. Okay. It was all. It was all programmed drums. Yeah. Hip hop mm. is is what you could, could could describe the the beats as. Yeah. Probably. Um and um we 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 we're all on ears and we have to wear the same costume that the ballet dancer right. the same the same out you know, design. Yeah, yeah. And uh there's a big riser at the back of the stage and we're all stood on it in mm-hmm. a big line. Right. And then um the ballet dancers do their thing. Right, it's half an hour long. And it's usually it's usually run with two other ballets. So when you buy your ticket, you go see two other ballets. Right, okay. Um and so I did it in two thousand and twelve and then two thousand and sixteen. And it was probably set to rerun this year. Oh, right, yeah. But of I can imagine probably it's not not going to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but that's um I mean, that's a whole different world, isn't it? I mean, that is yeah. completely divorced from, you know, play, play, <laughs> playing in um, with, with your mates, play, playing with Imelda or playing with Paolo and like, you know, okay. Yeah. Even though they, they, they have their own parameters, they kind of, they're rock shows. Yeah. You know, yeah. whereas this is. Oh, yeah, it was. So yeah. different. I've got to admit, it wasn't. Um, there were parts that were scored. Mm-hmm. But there are also parts that uh, Mark, we worked with Mark on, mm-hmm. and we just remembered them. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, it was a, a little bit of a little bit of both. So there was, you know, um, that the, the, we were given we were given given some scores for particular melodies to work out a part around, and then, uh, you know, the rehearsal was pretty good with that one. We did quite a lot of rehearsal, like a week of rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. Before it. And so Mark would just produce the show just like he does an album, right? And then you just, I just record it or whatever. We would re- we'd be recording in rehearsal, yeah. Um, so he would then at the end of the rehearsal send it to everyone, and there would be a stem of us, and he'd be like, "Play that, <laughs> wicked." <laughs> yeah, but um, and the last one we did, 2016, we actually went to his studio um, at the Tar Yard, which. Uh, I think he still owns, but he he's not in there anymore. Mm-hmm. And um, we tracked the whole live show, right? Uh, our stems in in the studio properly, mm-hmm. and uh, they were used within within the being projected as well. Right. Okay. All right. That's a really interesting way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> no, that's really cool. Right. What I really want to get onto. Because many years ago, I don't know what I was doing, but someone was knocking at the door. I didn't answer it. Um, and then I came down to the kitchen. I'd left my kitchen window open, and some, a mate of mine had been trying to give me a CD. It was uh, the first White Denim album. And oh, he'd, yeah. he'd just written on it and said, you've got to listen to this, and just put it in my kitchen window, and it was lying on the side of my sink. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I mean, since then, I've, you know, I've, I've absolutely loved them. So how did yeah. you end up working with them? Well, um... I was involved. Uh, I'm I'm not in the band anymore, but I was in a band called Black Peaches, mm-hmm. which um, is uh, was a, a band that was formed around a guy called Rob Smouten, who he's like a long-standing touring member of Hot Chip. You know, right. Band okay. Chip. He formed a band with five of us. We we, we got together and rehearsed, and then um, made an album. Off our own backs, and then um, we got signed to. Do you know James Endicott? Yes. We got. He signed us to his label. Mm-hmm. 
But around that time, when we were doing, you know, promoting that album, we got to support White Denim. Right, okay. And that's how I met them. And and the, we did like Islington Town, you know, the mm. Islington Town Hall. Yeah. And then um, they 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 had a really big show. They, they were they were, they were playing West Holt Stage, Glastonbury. Mm. This was 2016. Mm-hmm. And um, they they asked me to be part of that show uh, in the lineup mm-hmm. of their, their thing, and. The first thing that that happened was I went to Texas because they're based in they're based in Austin, mm-hmm. and um, went there and we rehearsed for five days for Glastonbury. <laughs> but we also we also jammed a lot, right? Uh, and actually, a song came the next record they did, which is two thousand and eighteen. I ended up with, with a you know a co-write on one of their songs. Right coming out of that those jam sessions right okay cool um did glastonbury it was re- it was really great it was, it was, it was a, a really fantastic also played glastonbury with black peaches that year as well right twice okay. once on the friday and the sunday that's cool <laughs> so it was a good glastonbury yeah yeah and then yeah and i've just kept in contact with them ever since really their lineups changed quite a lot a few times. They've got quite a, a changeable lineup of musicians, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, um, so yeah, I've just, yeah, I've, I've just remained friends with them. And then um, this March, I think it was like the day before the lockdown, James just sent me a text saying, look, we're congregating a big load of musicians together to remotely add parts to our songs and we're going to record this album in 30 days Wicked. so i spent the first 30 days of the lockdown being waking up and being sent a dropbox link and then the next night after i'd worked on it all day sending back riffs right and that's so i think i sent i don't know 20 minutes worth of riffs on top of their tunes mm-hmm. and i ended up on three tra- tracks yeah. that's really cool and happenstance as well obviously obviously because the way they decided to do it had nothing to do with lockdown and then lockdown happens let's yeah go, let's, let's do it remotely it's like oh well, thank god they decided to do that otherwise it would yeah been... yeah they're very um i i really like that i really like what they do i think it might be quite a popular thing in america um I haven't known it so much of any band bands over here, but they've obviously had a they've done well on their albums. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so they've got themselves to a position where they can have a studio. Yeah. It's their own studio. It's awesome. Yeah, wicked. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when they're not on tour, by default, they're up nine AM, they're in that studio. Yeah. Five PM. Yeah. You know. Nice. We're going home. And that's yeah. all they max stay there till midnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's their vibe. Yeah. That's literally 365. I mean, I'm sure they go on holiday, but you know, it's yeah. there's none of this. Oh, we'll have to, where should we go to record the next time? What studio? It, it's that's it. The, um, I mean, I've heard about a lot. There's a lot of American bands that do that thing. Yeah, I mean, it's like, well, my old band, Ocean Coliseum, we had our studio. Right. And it was one of the worst things we ever did is when we sold it. Right, yeah. Because, you know, we built our studio from nothing. Yeah. To, and then it got, with each album that we, re- we released, we were able to put more stuff in it and, you know, I mean, yeah. and make this it better. Yeah, this is be- what Wired Denim have done. Yeah, yeah. And, it's it, that, yeah. and it was, you've got this home, you can go whenever you want. Yeah. And we all knew one that we all knew. I knew how to run the desk and the guitarist kind of did, the other two didn't, but it was okay because I yeah. was always willing to engineer yeah. what, and play bass at the same time. So yeah. we, we had no cost as well as well yeah. you could spend yeah. a year making a record because you weren't actually spending 360 days recording that you know on the tracks you were jamming you were doing this you were trying this and eventually then you end up with we've got 50 songs yeah right <laughs> you know which is an That's amazing it. thing yeah and i feel um just through you know just just through rubbing shoulders with various projects as a as a side man or session player I, I do feel that not not enough British artists do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To and make they, that the most important thing that, they, that they've created a work, a work. You know, like they're seeing it as their job. Yeah, 
yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's a, yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's what I, I really admire about their life. Yeah, they, yeah. They just, yeah. That's that's really and, cool. And, and they're making great records. They're getting every time they release a record, it's radio play and um, yeah, it's just it's, more and more, more and more. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a great position to be in. I know. Um, that band um, Doves, I know they, they took, took quite a long time off, but I know they did the same thing. Yeah. Like, they've just had their studio. It's like, well, we can record when we want, you know. And say, you know, you get your budget from the record label. It's like, well, the last album only went silver, so you can have yeah. 35 grand to make the record. It's like, well, we're not yeah. going to spend that anyway, <laughs> because we haven't got, you know, 500 pounds a day renting out the townhouse or, you know, yeah. a grand a day renting out Mono Valley, you know, whatever it might yeah. be. I, I think another thing is that your if you do that, um, your method becomes quicker. Yeah. So it doesn't surprise me at all that that White Denim managed to do that thirty day thing. Yeah, yeah. Because it's just so they're just so well oiled at, at tracking and and getting the they know they know they you know they've gone through every every scenario that doesn't work to to, to you know, yeah. and they're just really experienced. Yeah. yeah. But what was it like doing, because um, obviously right now, people who are lucky enough to be able to do remote recording, that's what we have to do. Yeah. But, for, for, I mean, for me, I hate remote recording, because I like, right. I love being, even if it's just in the room with the producer, or maybe the drummer's there, or the totally. whole band's there, whatever it might be. Yeah, It's totally like, because I like to bounce off people. Yeah. You know. But obviously, yeah, I think, I think you, I think the method, I think the method that you, that you reach, if I'm going to be honest, I think sometimes you send a par that could be tweaked to be the perfect par. Yeah. But the other, the person on the other side just spins it. Yeah. And and that's a bit frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Because cause... Cause you don't know what they're thinking, your their perception. Yeah. And it, yeah, as you said, it could just be like a tiny thing. It could be like, mm. oh yeah, but could you not play the, you know, yeah, and they may know. They may know what that note is. They may that, be able to articulate with, it. Yeah, that takes one second yeah. if you're in the studio. But yeah. probably twenty four hours remote recording. Yeah, yeah. Forty eight hours if the person forgets to say it. Or you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's true. I did find myself with that particular project, and I have before. I don't know whether this is a good thing or not, mm. but I found myself sending neat little tidy riffs with gaps. <laughs> <laughs> so they could. <laughs> nice. so I just yeah do you know what I mean so they could chop easy yeah yeah. yeah. So that's a, I'm sure that's a remote recording, recording thing that other people do yeah. yeah it probably is I've never thought about that actually maybe that's where I'm going wrong I should just leave, <laughs> leave tiny little tiny little holes so they don't have to go oh for god's sake we're going to have to stretch this out now yeah and and sometimes it makes more sense if they can move it you know I'm sure I've done stuff for people before and they've moved it to a, to a different beat and you're like I didn't play it on that beat. Yeah, that's not that's not on the off beat. Well, it because is now. Because I, I made the the tail in the beginning <laughs> so perfect, they could just go. Dick, 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 right. you know, along yeah, that. yeah. That's all. I mean, so what what setup do you have in 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 the cabin then for recording? I've uh, just got in, in here. I've got another room mm. with a double door and um, my amps in there, wall box, and he just uses the Universal Apollo stuff, which right. is great and. And then I track with ribbon mic and a, and a dynamic. Nice. And then I also take a third split into just use the universal audio amps. Yeah. They find they're pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, the, then that's how I do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I'm always thinking of ways to improve it. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what's, um, what, out of all your guitars, because because yeah. obviously a lot of people get oh look at those guitars I want to know what is your go? Do you have a go to guitar? Yeah, it's uh, it's actually this one. Don't it's um <laughs> it's a uh, um a parts caster. Got you. So it's it's a Telecaster that that I put together with you know bits. Yeah, very yeah. popular nowadays. Yeah. Yeah, wicked. I do find myself playing it way, way more than any others. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I mean, obviously you've got a lot of guitars. I mean, I've got far too many basses. Yeah. But I always go to if you can see, I've got that. Oh yeah. SG there, Beautiful. and I've got a harmony over there. 
Um, oh, they're great. Yeah, and then my 73 Jazz. And then all the other ones I've got, hardly ever take them out their boxes. And my wife's always like, well, just get rid of them. It's like, no. <laughs> Why would I do that? I might, I, I may use them. Probably won't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right. No, there's, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Um, I think, I think, uh, I'll tell you why I don't get rid of guitars, because I, I, I always think to myself, there might be a gig where it comes in handy. Exactly. For the colour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the sound, or I might need one with a higher action or open tuned. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's why mine stay in their cases. Perfect, cause, good. Because I think, well, you know. <laughs> I might I might try that with my wife. She'll, yeah, she'll yeah, have try a clue. that one. Yeah, yeah I, might, I, I use that one. Yeah, yeah. I might. I, no, I need to keep that one in case I have, ever have to do a gig on the bass where it's, where it's open tuned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For all those chords I'm going to play, it's going to be a beautiful thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do often wonder about the yeah what the perfect the perfect guitar collection is as well. Um, and and uh, you know I just I don't go down that route. No. <laughs> so it's, it's a, it, not only is it sort of a late night um, eBay rabbit hole, but it's a financial disaster as well. Waiting. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> but, yeah, and you yeah. For, you've forgotten, and then like um, six Burns basses turn up, and like you know they're all like like made for teddy bears, and you're like, what? Did I buy yeah. this? <laughs> so what yeah, about yeah. um, you know, like, um, like your live setup? Because obviously studio, it's totally different. Do you have a particular thing that you use, like a your go to sort of amp and pedal setup or anything? Uh, I use a Mattress DC30 actually. Right. Okay. A lot, mm -hmm. and. Um, um, high, well, I quite like British sounding amps, yeah. I mean, matches is obviously California, but it's based on, a, on an AC30, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. High Watt Custom 100, I really like. I, nice. use, that, I use that sometimes. But um, a lot of times where I have to um, hire fly, flying gigs where you have to hire, um, I just always choose, I think, my go-to one. I just, I just love them. I don't know why I don't own one, but I don't is the deluxe reverb fender yes even the factory ones yeah. off the factory they're a great that's a great um versatile amp and yeah 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 so that's probably one even though i don't own it that i really like yeah i really like those amps yeah it's funny you, you see you say that because there's um a guitarist called adam phillips who works on and off with richard on on our shows. okay so, so when we're doing the um, fly fly shows even yeah. though the UK shows, it's all Voxes. Yeah. When, when, we, when, we do, when we do the hide gear shows, it's that amp. Right. And yeah. he hasn't even got one at home. He's just like, yeah, yeah. but it always works. <laughs> yeah, and also they're, they're just so controllable yeah. in any stage situation, yeah. 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 And what about... It's um, nice when you get somewhere in it and they give it to you and it's a 60, oh, God. 61 or something, you're like, oh, yes. Because yeah. they always sound better. They're yeah. just that extra. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course they do. It's like me. But some a... higher companies have them, you know. Oh, yeah, totally. For me, yeah. it's, for me, it's Amp um, Ampegs or Ashdowns. And it's like yeah. the thing where you go, and yeah, Ampeg SVT. And it, you like you turn up in Mexico and there's a 60s one on stage. You go, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. my God. Yes. <laughs> yeah. One or two things, is, one or two things is going to happen. You're going to turn it on. It's going to buzz so much you can't use it. <laughs> Or it's going to be like a Rolls Royce. Like, yeah. Please turn it on. There's no buzz. It's beautiful. Yeah. Fantastic. So, who are your main influences? I mean, obviously they change. You know, when, when I was just going, maybe like not necessarily going back to when you started because it was like you know sort of classic rock. But as players, do you have, do you have like a bank of influences or people that you can't get out of your system that will always kind of be there? I'm I'm pretty drawn. I'm pretty draw, drawn towards. Um, I'm, I'm pretty. I, I say I'm pretty drawn towards any any guitar player who has a virtuosic uh, element of their playing mm -hmm. that also involves jazz harmony. Mm -hmm. So someone like Frank Zappa, right? Um, but I also love blues guitarists. I like the Brit, the British blues. British Blues Explosion, Clapton, Jimmy Page. Um, that definitely floats. I've definitely, yeah, I've definitely got a, a top ten of, of guitar <laughs> players, yeah. Um, 
and and I, and I, re- I really like uh, Pat Metheny. Right. Okay. Even though, even though I probably, I I don't come close to the jazz chops that he that he has, and and even. I don't even study his chord movements or anything, but I, but I love listening to his music and his uh, his voice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Every every you know every every line of music. I think there's a guitarist that I I think oh, I really like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what fun. what notes they've left out, what notes they've put in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I like what you said there. The notes they left out. That's the bit that yeah. I that fascinates me as well. Yeah, it's like again, it's like going back, you know, and that comes from experience and listening to other people but, yeah you know I, f- I find a lot of people um think it's maybe it's pure to down to inexperience and that maybe they'll they'll eventually change but it's like loads of notes it's like, but you know the bits you don't play they make the bits you do play sound so much more important yeah yeah you know and yeah. again and again it's I like think... sorry so it's, it's again it's like you know you're doing your, your, your little riffs with the gaps <laughs> yeah to, to send off I think probably, um, I think probably what floats my boat as far as as far as if if I'm in if I'm in a mood to listen to a piece of music where I go, whoa! I think I probably probably what it is, and that might tie into why I might be suited to white denim more. Or we just got a connection. Is I like jam bands. Uh-huh. <laughs> I do like I do like sticking the headphones on and listening to the Grateful Dead. Or I just <laughs> Uh, that that's definitely that, that's definitely something I like, and actually, um, I, I find Clapton is a bit he's a bit he's a bit like that. He was a bit like that in the sixties, yeah. you know, and that's that's probably what I started listening to, and that kind of uh, suits something. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I like that that whole attitude is that it can go anywhere. That's you know, it. It's where is it going that. to evolve into? Yeah, it's not prescribed. Yeah, no, no. I mean, obviously, yeah. everyone's got their. I, well, even the groove template, but everyone's got the template, whether it's 12 bar or whatever it might be. Yeah. You know, this is the starting point. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder actually also um, how um, working as working as a musician mm-hmm. in maybe working as a musician and being told to play parts on many occasions, mm-hmm. maybe that has influenced in my taste as a as as the years have passed, you know, maybe that's why I crave. <laughs> yeah, I've oh, gone. Give me a Grateful Dead concert, three hours long. You know, maybe that's why I do. You know, yeah, yeah, it could well be. Yeah, be- because I don't, I don't then go. I don't want to then go and listen to something prescribed because it might remind me of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, a stem that I've got to play along <laughs> yeah, with. It. Exactly. Could could be. I don't. Know. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be like the yeah. subconsciously. <laughs> part, it's probably subconsciously part, part of that. Yeah. No, that's yeah. that's really interesting. All right, one well, of the final thing I'm going to ask you, and I've asked, yeah. asked, asked this to everybody, some people have found it incredibly irritating and some people have immediately said what they are. But can you pick three things, three recordings you've made that really stand out for you? They might not necessarily, oh, that one was the most successful or that was the first thing they did, whatever it is. Because what we then do is <clears throat> we put links to Amazon. How cool, yes. Um... Well, I can definitely think of two off the top of my head. Uh, the first one is, as previously mentioned, a song called Double Death by White Dennett. Um, I, I played on the track and I, I wrote a few, a few wrote with, with the guys. I kind of, you know, we put the riffs together over a few days and mm-hmm. I definitely had a, had a part in that tune playing, playing you know, coming out of some of the riffs in there. And... Um, I ended up on the recording as well because the original tracking that we were, that we were, that we were tracking on an eight track Atari tape machine um, made it through to the, to the, to the final product, which is great. Yeah. Even though I think they retracked the drums again with a different drummer. And mm-hmm. uh, so that, that definitely stands out for me. I, I, I really, I, I, it's, yeah, I was just, yeah, I was really pleased to, to have been that. Yeah. When they texted me to say, this is it. And it's going to come out. I was like, wow. It's wicked. Um, another one is the uh, the Jonathan Ross theme tune, which was actually um, uh, part of recording. Actually, that Vaughan was uh, engineering. Oh right, okay. Yeah, um, with Mark Ronson, um, Andy Burrows on drums, um, and uh, I think Mark played bass. Mm-hmm. And um, 
Barry Cadigan played yeah, yeah. Some, he played like surf guitar on it but um, I played on that <laughs> I played some I think I just I literally I was, I was just holding down the rhythm guitar uh -huh. on it <laughs> and um, it, it was for, it was for the it's part of a, a remake of the film Arthur which Russell Brand was of was Arthur and that tune was in the in in the film mm -hmm. but it then got obviously used for the Jonathan Ross theme tune and it has to this day yeah yeah, yeah. so every, every time you uh, <laughs> you can't avoid well, it yeah. yeah and then probably just my third is probably just my involvement with the band Black Peaches and mm -hmm. all of the all of the because the Black the, Peaches records are fantastic they're so interesting cool yeah it's not yeah I know it's like that it's not what you expect yeah you know yeah. even when you look you know you read oh it's combination of X with Y and you go yeah but it ends yeah. up sounding like Z it's not what you know, yeah. I just love love the sound of those of, of those records. So we could pick yeah. any of those and put a link. In fact, just link to all of them. All of them, yeah. Put them all, all in. There. So what ha what what happened with Black Peaches then? Well, we just we just came to um, a situation where um, where it, it the second record was coming along. Um, a new manager. Mm -hmm. New, uh, you've got to be careful what I say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, second record came along, it was about to be released, and it just, you know, we needed to form an infrastructure of how we were all going to distribute the rights. And we just didn't see eye to eye on something. Right. Yeah. It was nothing to do with the music. I loved the music, I loved the guys, and um, yeah, we just, just parted ways, but um. I st I'm still really, really proud. I still want to play with them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I still yeah, want yeah. to go and play with them again one day, and hopefully that happens. But... Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh, we'll put we'll put that up as well. But yeah, those, those things happen in music, don't they? I mean, I've been in those positions. Yeah, where it's just like it's always sad when you. It's nothing to do with the music or the people, mm -hmm. and you put your hand up and say, "Look, is there any way we could just, you know." just move this around so it's a little bit fairer for everyone and, yeah. and then you and then you're out you know yeah yeah that, yeah that's i'm sure that's so common isn't it you know <laughs> Very, really yeah. Common. <laughs> yeah well that's that yeah, was like, but i liked it I, I didn't fall out with anyone I yeah, liked yeah the music. exactly you know what there, I mean? there wasn't any musical differences it was just all people all yeah people yeah yeah. Differences. yeah yeah it's weird yeah. yeah but i suppose you know wh whatever stage a project is at it, it has to have a, a revenue stream infrastructure, doesn't it? Of course it does, yeah. And if one person's needs ch threaten to change that, it can easily be decided, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much today. This has been awesome. Thank you, Damon. Yeah, it's been really great to, to chat to you. Yeah, and uh, well, hopefully in the not-too-distant future, we'll actually can have a second pint. I might be at Rockfield. Oh, well, um, yeah. I say, <laughs> if you are, let me know. And we'll actually go out for a real beer. Do you know Sean Ganocchi? Yes, of course I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, he yeah, because he played with Richard Ashford, didn't he? He um, there's a project that he's producing mm -hmm. um, with a poet, um, and yeah, it's <laughs> it was on the cards. We were going to go to Rockfield. Um, so it might be there with Sean and um, Co making this album yeah. at some point. Well, it's, that means it's literally down the road. So if it happens, yeah. we'll have a beer. Yeah, mon I mean, Mono, I spent quite a lot of time <sighs> at Mono um, with recording with this artist called Hero Fisher, mm -hmm. a singer. And uh, yeah, uh, I've spent a lot of time walking the roads and it's, it's, it's a superb place to live, It's yeah. beautiful, yeah, it is. Rats. It's very <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone um, you'd like us to talk to for the for this series? Because I've been asking that for everyone. Is there anyone you'd like to see a chat with? They've, they've got to be not inaccessible or dead. Because <laughs> someone said, yeah, Kate Bush. I was like, mm, could be a bit of a stretch to get older Kate. One of my friends, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've done a bit of playing with him over the last past year or so, is Robbie McIntosh. Okay. Do you know Robbie? Do you yeah. know Robbie? Yeah. Absolutely. So, firstly, he's a lovely guy. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and also, 
he's got some incredible I mean he's he's had a career like you would not believe as a guitar player mm -hmm. he's, he would be someone that he's someone that a whole group of friends that I know we all look up to you know but I could I could definitely ask him for you if you could that would be fantastic well, I'll, I'll I'm telling you it, you would it, you would love to chat to him yeah he's he's yeah he's brilliant if you could hook us up that'd be amazing yeah right. yeah yeah real well it's been a pleasure cool Thanks, Evan. Th yeah. Thank you very much. A huge virtual round of applause.